So, um, I'm, um, I'm a little bit obsessed with paper and printing and making things interactive. And um, a couple of years ago, a year ago or so, I gave a talk and I had to think about, you know, maybe where, this, where did this come from? What, what, what happened? How did I get like this? And I look back to when um, I was a child. And I remember that I filled my bedroom with, with wires. I kind of hid them behind the walls, threaded them through the walls, hid them under the carpet. And I was wiring up speakers and switches and batteries. And I was trying to make my bedroom interactive, but kind of hidden away. And I, I kind of used to play this game of speaking through microphones and trying to trick my siblings that I really was somewhere that I wasn't, probably hiding in the attic with the voice coming out of the wardrobe. Um, I was a little bit weird. <laughs> um, but for me, it was kind of like, it wasn't overt technology. And actually, that almost implies it was covert technology. It wasn't. It was <laughs> it's just more about just everyday things being interactive. And that's, that's what I really love. And um, I also remember I borrowed one of my dad's books and carved out the insides, I guess, the idea when you borrow something is you're going to give it back, but <laughs> this book was past it. I carved out the insides, and I got a radio transmitter, a sort of FM radio transmitter, and I hid it inside, and I placed it next to my parents so that I could eavesdrop on them. Um, <laughs> it could have gone horribly wrong. <laughs> um, and, but I really wasn't interested in what they were saying. It's just more, again, kind of like the idea of doing that. I liked an, of, an everyday object kind of like having something in it and doing something a little, a little more. I guess partly because I was obsessed with strange things like that, that I didn't do particularly well at school. Um, and um, actually listening to a lot of the other amazing talks, almost in each talk there's something in it that I can really relate to. And I imagine we probably all feel like that. So I was kind of the kid that didn't do particularly well at school. And then um, I went off and I went off traveling and I spent a few years in Australia and I ended up working on a sheep farm for a few years and I was herding sheep, kind of counting sheep, but it taught me some really important lessons that pretty much everything we need is all around us all the time and that nature has the answers to the things, to the questions that we have all the time and that what we really have to do um, is, just, is just learn to listen. Um, so that was kind of like quite a big part of my education. But then I really craved a more formal education. And so I managed to work my way back into Australia via spending about, a, sorry, back into university from Australia after spending about a year getting, getting home. And somehow um, I managed to do really well at university because I kind of had this thirst for knowledge and the thirst for just wanting to know more, wanting to learn. And, um, I guess to say I became a scientist, I guess I was always a scientist because, you know, just really inquisitive. Um, I ended up doing a PhD in physics at Cambridge, which for me was a really great achievement, especially considering I never passed my English O-level, failed three Ds. <laughs> um, um, and, um, but my PhD was pretty simple. It was too, um, it was... <laughs> <laughs> It was. It was moving electrons around one at a time, which I kind of realized was just like counting sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did. I, uh, my PhD was how to move an electron around, one electron at a time. Count them on and, and count them off. Um, but I also became really interested in, um, in startups, and, and, I, and I joined a startup um, that span out of Cambridge. And the philosophy behind that startup was how we could use printing to create electronics. Um, and in my PhD, it was really hands-on. It was really all about making things. I learned how to make transistors. I learned how to make chips. And, you know, we kind of did everything ourselves, which, was, which I found really fascinating. Um, but when I joined, I joined this startup and saw what you could do with printing, that inspired me even more. And I worked there for four years. Um, and then I decided to kind of venture out on my own. So I left, and I turned my garage into an electronics clean room by sort of stealing bits of kit from the skips at the university and kind of built this, this, this crazy scientist's lab. Um, but it's just really fired me up with printing and what you can do with printing. And I went to visit printing factories and I saw machines running, you know, substrates bigger than, wider than me, um, as fast as a car goes, 
goes down the high, goes down a highway. And just seeing printing as a manufacturing process was really fascinating. Um, and this has been quite a journey. It's been about 10 years since I started out. And it's kind of coincidental that kind of like where I am now with the technology that I've developed um, in terms of printing and um, printing conductive inks and combining it with simple electronics, kind of used the processor, a 6502 processor. That was what the processor that was in the Apple II. And I stick that onto a piece of paper to add touch onto pieces of paper and sound. And the reason why Kasana say it's coincidental is because to the iPad generation, print is just a broken touch screen. And we've all heard the stories of kids that kind of try to swipe on a magazine page um, or try to do a pinch and zoom on something. Um, well, I'm quite excited about the idea of fixing print, not that it, you know, it really needs, needs fixing. I do have some bits of print. Um, so you have to bear with me while I keep grabbing lots of stuff that I've got, which might all go horribly wrong. Um, yeah, so this is something that we printed on a, a label press, which is, I tried to do a big dramatic thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then explained it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so these are touch pads, so they're XY touch pads printed on a label press um, about 50 meters a minute. Um, and it is exactly the same touch technology that you get on an iPad. This is an opaque version and we have a transparent version. So it's multi-touch and it's just silver ink printed on a printing press. And it's kind of really exciting that some of the things we're going to be able to do with that. On a machine that normally prints shampoo bottle labels, um, not that we're going to put them on shampoo bottle labels. Um, I'll show you some more things. Yeah, so, so now we do a lot of creating things like posters. So I'll just explain a bit how it works. Um, yeah. So this is carbon ink printed on a sheet of paper. On the other side, we print graphics and then stick a small circuit board on there that adds power, uh, um, logic, and sound. <laughs> and these posters are drum kits, so probably shouldn't do this, but I'm gonna give them out to someone in the play with and make some noise. <laughs> Thanks, it's so much fun. <laughs> Don't know, anyone can play with it, right. Um, right, more things. Yeah, so, um, oh, dear. <laughs> that was the clangers. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, I kind of live in this, in this dream world. And, and as a scientist, um, you know, I love making things interactive and whatever, but what I realized was really lacking was creativity. So the first person that I hired into my team was a graphic designer. So I'm really passionate about working with artists, about working with musicians, graphic designers, and kind of like bringing the two together. Because if not, it's just, it's things like that that kind of look good in a geeky way, but don't really do very much, so. Lawrence Arabia invites you into his parents' Jeep. So, yeah, I'll just explain what that actually was. <laughs> so, um, what's really cool is that I live in this dream world, and um, people are actually starting to believe me. So, this, <laughs> this, was, this was put on the streets of New Zealand earlier on this year. So, the, um, there was a few hundred, actually not this size, really huge ones, A0. And there were music players in the streets of New Zealand. Um, also, um, we did a poster that was a synesthetic taste experience where you could swipe it and it would connect to your phone and you'd hear what sounds might, what tastes, taste might sound like. Um, right, and I'm running out of time, so hmm. I'm going to show you something else. This is an, al an album um, that we're printing just this week, actually printed last week and putting together next week. Um, and it's for a DJ called Cuba, and, um, 
Anyway, it's a really beautiful piece of artwork. The design was done in, in New York. Um, actual vinyl. And the DJ decks um, actually work. I'm going to try and get them working. Just bear with me. <laughs> Right, the sound is up. Is the sound up on my phone? Okay. Oh, it is working, honest. Okay. <laughs> this is so challenging, and I know I'm out of time. I don't care. Snoop <laughs> I have a few other demos, but there's no, not very much time now. Um, I was using my Moleskine notebook that has, um, it's actually a music controller for my phone. So when I touch this, I can, I can control the volume on my mobile phone. Um, <laughs> I can choose what tracks play, it's pretty cool. But it's the same sort of thing, you know, it's like everyday objects being interactive. Um, and also made this book for a singer-songwriter called Charlotte, and it's a book about her music. But in touching um, some Bluetooth portals in that book, you can connect to her Facebook, and you can connect to her as she's creating an album. So the idea is, is that in buying it, you're supporting her to create a new album, um, but there's a kind of a connection made between a fan and an artist in a totally different way. And it is kind of this thing of just everyday objects being interactive, being connected, and that print and paper could be the portal to the internet rather than actually through a, through a mobile phone. Um, and this is a poster. Um, so this is Charlotte, and she's created um, it's an EP, and it's the first EP to be released in poster form. So. Keep a smile on your face. actually deliberate. <laughs> so it's actually meant to be a little fail. I make these mistakes and then like to explain them. So Charlotte's going to come and sing a song and Charlotte's someone who I work with a lot. So um, I'd like to ask Charlotte to come and Join me on stage. Mm -hmm. Hi. Sometimes we just don't know what's going on inside people's heads. Maybe we need to listen to what's being said. Forget what's going on around you. Follow your heart. Let emotions surround you. The people that you see. The people that you don't see. Could only fall down The people that you see The people that you don't see Can only fall down, down and down Down and down, down and down, down In the 
negative people spend negative around the place I don't need that in my life so I just turn into a Doesn't mean I forget the things you said about that one day It was just you and me, how happy it seems How happy it seems It's all about them damn good vibes, no matter who by your side One second to think a lifetime to decide about who you wanna be Not who you see on the street, are you impressing yourself or the ones that you meet In a situation where you're faced to realize the consequence that you've made And people around are singing Cause the people that you see, the people that you don't see can only fall down The people that you see The people that you don't see Can only fall down Down and down Down and down Die down. You better go, 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 go You better go The people that you see, the people that you don't see, can only fall down. The people that you see, the people that you don't see, can only fall down, down and down, down and down. Die. The people. That you see the people that you don't see can only fall down. Thank you.